Number five of London Ancient and Modern. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two London from the Medical Point of View. Part two The College of Physicians. The time was now at hand when the first step was to be taken to give the profession a position of independence and to allow it to regulate its own affairs without reference to ecclesiastical dignitaries we owe this in all probability to thomas Linacre, who possessed the confidence of cardinal wolsey and probably also of the king be that as it may on september twenty third fifteen eighteen letters patent were granted constituting the royal college of physicians by this instrument the college was given the control of all medical practitioners in london and within seven miles of it and none were to be allowed to practice unless previously examined by the college four years later these powers were extended to the whole of england except in the case of university graduates the charter and subsequent act gave ample power to the college to regulate its affairs and accorded privileges and exemptions to the physicians similar to those previously accorded to the surgeons the great fact however was the power of controlling the profession and it must be remembered that the censors had power to fine and imprison delinquents in henry's charter six persons were named viz john chamber thomas lanaker ferdinand de victoria nicholas halswell john francis and robert yaxley and it will be interesting to consider the personality of some of these founders of the royal college the real founder and first president was thomas lanaker who was born in fourteen sixty having graduated at oxford and become a fellow of all souls in fourteen eighty four he went abroad in fourteen eighty five and visited bologna florence where he enjoyed the friendship of lorenzo de medici rome venice and the famous school of padua where he took the degree of m d in fifteen o one he was appointed physician and preceptor to prince arthur and also physician to henry the seventh he was also physician to henry the eighth and it is recorded that he was consulted by many men of note notably cardinal wolsey and erasmus he took holy orders in fifteen o nine and the same year was presented to the rectory of mersham then became prebend of wells fifteen ten rector of hawkehurst fifteen ten canon of st stephen's westminster prebend of york fifteen seventeen presenter of york fifteen nineteen rector of halsworthy devon fifteen eighteen and rector of wigan lancashire fifteen twenty this list of eight clerical benefices in almost as many years benefices which were probably given as professional fees and which were probably passed on as soon as given to a successor for a consideration throws a curious light on the state of the church and helps us to understand the crash which was so soon to come it is interesting as showing the origin of the medical within the clerical profession to remember that the first president of the college of physicians was the rector of four parishes the occupant of two prebendal stalls a canon and a precentor we all owe a debt of gratitude to lenniker he not only obtained the charter for the college but gave his house in knightrider street which is a street running parallel to part of queen victoria street e c as a meeting-place for the new corporation all who are competent to judge seem agreed in stating that lenniker was one of the greatest scholars of his age and possessed a knowledge of latin and greek which for that time was quite exceptionally great he founded lectureships at oxford and cambridge he died in fifteen twenty four six years after the foundation of the college and was buried in old st paul's where in fifteen fifty seven keyes erected a monument with an epitaph of his own composing of john chambre the first person named in the charter we know little but it is interesting to note that he was a fellow of merton college oxford that he studied at padua that he was physician to the king that he was censor of the college in fifteen twenty three that he was doubly a vicar doubly an archdeacon a prebend a canon and a dean and the treasurer of bath cathedral he died in fifteen forty nine 
of the other four persons named in the charter we know very little and they need not detain us lenacher's house which was given by its owner was the first home of the college of physicians was occupied by the college until sixteen fourteen and remained the property of the college until eighteen sixty when it was taken for the crown by an act of parliament only the front part of the house was given to lineker the back part belonging to merton college oxford which is one of the many connections between merton college and the college of physicians the house represented at page sixty one was certainly not lineker's original dwelling we have thus seen the science of medicine in london beginning with the clergy then organized under the supervision of bishops and deans and finally with an independent controlling body of which the early members were many of them in holy orders it will now be convenient to trace the subsequent history of the college of physicians and i shall endeavour to bring before the mind's eye some of its most remarkable early fellows and in so doing i shall hope to give some idea of the condition of medicine in london in the days of the tudor and stuart sovereigns my information on these points is mainly drawn from dr monk's learned work entitled the role of the royal college of physicians of london a very prominent figure in the early history of medicine in london was john kay or keys as he called himself well known by name at least in connection with gonville and keys college cambridge which he enlarged and endowed keys was born in fifteen ten and studied at gonville hall cambridge which was ultimately to be better known by his own name he went to padua in fifteen thirty nine and lived in the same house with the celebrated anatomist vesalius he became professor of greek at padua and took the m d there in fifteen forty one he became fellow of royal college of physicians in fifteen forty seven and settled in london in fifteen fifty two he was president of the college in fifteen fifty five he was physician to edward the sixth mary and elizabeth but he is said to have been removed from the latter position because of his romish tendencies he died in fifteen seventy three at his house in bartholomew close and was buried in the chapel of keys college with the epitaph fui keys keys was certainly rich as is shown by his splendid munificence at cambridge although he was much occupied at cambridge in the latter years of his life he was frequently re-elected to the presidency of the college the last time being in fifteen seventy one the frequent re-election of a president who was latterly much of an absentee may have been from the hope that the college would ultimately obtain some of his great wealth but if this were so of which indeed there is no evidence the college was doomed to disappointment keys appears to have had great regard for form and order he was the inventor of the insignia of office the silver wand the book of statutes and the cushion which are still used by the president of the college on the occasion of the funeral of dr bartlett in fifteen fifty six we learn that the college attended in state and that the book of statutes adorned with silver was carried before the president keys was very punctilious about the respect to be paid to the dead and we find it laid down in the statutes of keys college that the president fellows and students are to attend the funerals of subjects used for dissection with as much reverence and pomp as though it were the corpse of some more worthy person because of the advantage which they had derived from it keys kept the accounts of the college with great accuracy and in fifteen sixty on the termination of his first six years of office handed over the whole of the funds to his successor amounting to fifty five pounds thirteen shillings threepence he wrote out the annals of the college with his own hand and thus did much to establish order in the proceedings his love of what we should call ritual seems to have led him into trouble in his later years and a large amount of material connected with religious ceremonial which was found in keys college was burnt by order of the vice-chancellor keys was a profound scholar and edited many of the writings of galen celsus and hippocrates he was also a naturalist and wrote a treatise on british dogs his only original medical work was a book or counsel against the sweat a treatise in fact on the sweating sickness 
strangely enough the first edition was in english but its ultimate appearance was in orthodox latin he was much concerned about the faulty pronunciation of latin in this country and tried to introduce the continental method of pronouncing the vowels to which he had become accustomed during his long residence abroad he was something of an antiquary and proved to his own satisfaction that the university of cambridge was founded by canterbur b c three ninety four he defended the privileges of the college and in a case tried before the lord mayor in the reign of elizabeth as to the right of surgeons to give internal remedies for the sciatica and so forth the evidence of president keyes seems to have convinced the court that they had no such right the name of keyes is inseparably connected with the teaching of anatomy in this country when king henry the eighth in fifteen forty gave the charter to the barber surgeons of which i shall have more to say hereafter the following important clause formed part of the charter the said masters or governors of the mystery and commonality of barbers and surgeons of london and their successors yearly for ever after their said discretions at their free liberty and pleasure shall and may have and take without contradiction four persons condemned adjudged and put to death for felony by the due order of the king's laws of this realm for anatomies without any further suit or labour to be made to the king's highness his heirs and successors for the same when the first anatomy lectures were given at barber surgeons hall is not quite clear but according to south it was before fifteen sixty three and according to sir george baker dr keyes was the first lecturer appointed and this appointment was made shortly after his return from italy which was in fifteen forty seven it was during keyes's lifetime and while he was taking an active interest in the college although not actually president namely in fifteen sixty five that queen elizabeth accorded to the physicians facilities with regard to anatomy similar to those enjoyed by the barber surgeons and it is evident from the statute of keyes college which i just now read and which has been kindly brought to my notice by mr ransom that keyes made proper arrangements for the teaching of anatomy in connection with his cambridge foundation anatomy is the very groundwork of medicine and without it it can have no existence as a branch of science undoubtedly we owe a deep debt of gratitude to the barber surgeons to the college of physicians and to dr keyes i cannot dismiss this remarkable man without further illustrating his character by recalling three events which took place at the college during the time that keyes was president in fifteen fifty eight christopher langton m d f r c p was expelled from the college for rashness levity and foolish contentions with his colleagues at consultations as well as for incontinency five years later for this latter failing this worthy was carted through london in a ridiculous attire in fifteen fifty nine john gaines m d f r c p was cited before the college for impugning the infallibility of galen on his acknowledgment of error and humble recantation he was received into the college in fifteen fifty six the college objected to the admission by the university of oxford of one david lawton an illiterate coppersmith the college laid before cardinal pole and the visitors the following instance of his illiteracy cuius infantia cum suggestit ut quo modo corpus declinaritur exerimus respondit hic hic et hoc corpus accusativo corporum adding egregius certa ex universitate medicus qui humana vita cometeritur this objection was successful clearly formal president keyes was not the man to countenance loose morals heterodoxy or bad grammar we must not dismiss keyes without alluding to the doctor keyes of shakespeare as drawn in the merry wives of windsor shakespeare's keyes is described as a french physician and throughout the play he is made to speak broken english keyes died in fifteen seventy three when the poet was ten years old and it is very probable that shakespeare borrowed the name without thinking of the man 
on the other hand it must be remembered that keyes probably spoke latin like a frenchman and that he lost favour at the court of elizabeth and it is possible that shakespeare may have heard him held up to ridicule but to proceed with the history of the college and its relations to medical education in fifteen eighty one dr caldwell and lord lumley founded the lumleyans lectures in anatomy and surgery and the importance of this foundation will be appreciated when it is stated that harvey was lumleyan lecturer from sixteen fifteen to sixteen fifty six and that it was in these lectures that the great fact of the circulation was first demonstrated in fifteen eighty seven we find the college renting a garden for forty marks a year and engaging john gerard the author of the well-known herbal to keep it stocked for them with rare plants gerard himself had a garden in holborn where among other things he propagated the potato william gilbert who was president of the college in sixteen hundred was the first really scientific fellow he was physician to elizabeth and james i and his great work on magnetism de magnete magnetisci corporibus e de magno magnete tellurae physiologia nova commanded the admiration of bacon and galileo and of many succeeding generations of scientists it is a work worthy of being placed alongside of harvey's work on the circulation and the college of physicians is honoured to have reckoned him among its presidents the importance of gilbert's investigations to a great naval power seems to have been recognised by queen elizabeth who to her great honour assisted him with a pension he died in sixteen o three aged sixty three and was buried at colchester he was the contemporary of shakespeare and bacon and was one of those who helped to make the elizabethan era the wonder of all subsequent generations the post-mortem examination made on the body of james i is an interesting record of the state of pathology in sixteen twenty five it is recorded that the head was found so full of brains that they could not keep them from spilling a great mark of his infinite judgment but his blood was wonderfully tainted with melancholy and the corruption thereof was the supposed cause of his death i have now to mention the man who above all others has tended by his work to make medicine a science and who probably did much by his lectures at the college to disseminate a knowledge of anatomy and physiology harvey was the first english physiologist and lectured for forty-one years at the royal college of physicians on anatomy and surgery william harvey fifteen seventy eight to sixteen fifty seven went to padua in fifteen ninety eight and studied under fabricius menados and caesarius and took his m d in sixteen o two he came to london in sixteen o four became f r c p in sixteen o seven and succeeded dr wilkinson at st bartholomew's in sixteen o nine he was lumleyan lecturer in sixteen fifteen he expounded as is supposed the doctrine of the circulation in sixteen sixteen and finally published his views in sixteen twenty eight he was physician to james the first in sixteen eighteen in sixteen thirty eight he was appointed physician in ordinary to charles the first and there is a curious order in the letter-book of the lord steward's office for the settling a diet of three dishes of meat and meal with all incidents thereunto belonging upon the said dr harvey which daily diet was subsequently commuted for two hundred pounds a year harvey followed the fortunes of the king and was at the battle of edgehill in sixteen forty two meanwhile his house in london was plundered of goods and anatomical records he became warden of merton college oxford in sixteen forty five from which post he was ousted by the parliament in sixteen forty six by the solicitation of sir george ent he was induced to publish his work on generation in sixteen fifty one he gave a new library and museum to the college of physicians in sixteen fifty three whereupon the fellows placed his statue in their hall and in his absence elected him president in sixteen fifty four which honour however he gracefully declined and recommended the college to elect dr prugene instead he remained lumley and lecturer until sixteen fifty six when he resigned and presented the college with his patrimonial estate at burmarsh kent 
he died of the gout in 1657 in his 80th year in his will he says i give to the college of physicians all my books and papers and my best persia long carpet and my blue satin embroidered cushion one pair of brass and irons with fire shovel and tongues of brass for the ornament of the meeting-room i have erected for the purpose item i give my velvet gown to my loving friend mr dr scarborough desiring him and my loving friend mr dr ent to look over those scattered remnants of my poor library and what books papers or rare collection they shall think fit to present to the college and the rest to be sold and with the money buy better thus it will be seen that harvey is not only the greatest ornament of the college but also its greatest benefactor he was the second in order of time of the great lights of science connected with the college gilbert being the first his will is interesting from the choice of his executors who were both fellows of the royal society and leaders of science and secondly by the mention of the velvet gown which possibly is the one represented as worn by sir c scarborough in the picture at barber's hall i abstain from any mention of harvey's great discovery because we all know it and appreciate it and no words of mine could increase your admiration i may here mention that in sixteen fourteen the house in knightsrider street had become too small for the business of the college and accordingly new premises were taken on lease from the dean and chapter of st paul's at amen corner at the end of paternoster row a botanical garden was planted and a theatre was built and here it was that harvey made the college a present of a great parlour and a museum which he erected at his own cost the garden extended from the old bailey to the church of st martin ludgate and included the site of the present stationers hall the museum and library soon became enriched by many contributions the greater part of which were however unhappily destroyed by the fire in sixteen sixty six dr gulston f r c p sixteen eleven founded by will the gulstonian lectures to be read between michaelmas and easter by one of the four youngest doctors of the college sir theodore mayern f r c p sixteen sixteen was by birth a swiss protestant and after serving as physician to henry the fourth of france settled in london where he became physician to james the first and his queen and subsequently to charles the first he was the fashionable physician of his day and was one of the first to use chemical medicines which was looked upon as heretical by the strict galenists who used only simples drawn from organic nature he introduced calomel and blackwash wrote the dedication to the first edition of the pharmacopoeia londonensis sixteen eighteen accumulated great wealth and died at chelsea in sixteen fifty five sir charles scarborough succeeded harvey as lumleian lecturer and was lecturer on anatomy to the barber surgeons he was physician to charles the second james the second and william the third and was a great mathematician baldwin hamy junior f r c p sixteen thirty four a devoted royalist and churchman enjoyed a lucrative practice among amorous parliamentary puritans he presented the lease of the college in amen corner to his colleagues sixteen fifty one contributed largely to its rebuilding after the fire and left it a considerable landed estate near ongar in essex francis glisson f r c p sixteen thirty five regius professor of physic at cambridge was president of the college in sixteen sixty seven eight and nine he wrote a treatise on rickets was a serious anatomist wrote a treatise on the anatomy of the liver and has given us glisson's capsule as a record of his industry and talent he was one of the original members of the royal society and one of the few of the fellows of the college who stopped in london during the plague he was a friend of anthony ashley earl of shaftesbury we are indebted to dr glisson for positive additions to our knowledge of the human body and he is to be regarded as the third in order of time of the scientific fellows 
thomas wharton f r c p 1650 thomas willis f r c p 1664 and richard lower f r c p 1675 were three earnest and distinguished anatomists who added new facts to medicine and whose names are still enshrined in our anatomical nomenclature end of part five number six of london ancient and modern this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two london from the medical point of view part three the plague we now approach the year sixteen sixty five so notable for the terrible pestilence which afflicted london and we may well take the opportunity of seeing what was the practice of physicians at this time the best account of the plague is that written by dr nathaniel hodges under the title loimologia this treatise originally written in latin and published by the author in sixteen seventy two was translated by dr john quincy in seventeen twenty from this valuable work we gain some insight into the moral and physical conditions of the population and of other causes which tended to increase the virulence of the epidemic it was at the close of the year sixteen sixty four that cases of plague a disease which had previously committed extensive ravages in london began to occur and the fears of the inhabitants were fomented by astrologers and others who tormented the ignorant with prophecies as to the evils which would occur from the conjunction of saturn and jupiter in sagittarius and the like again the action of the magistrates who ordered that infected houses should be marked with a red cross and the legend lord have mercy upon us and who further set a guard upon such houses to prevent either ingress or egress was probably most mischievous as tending to spread the infection amongst all the inhabitants of a house and to keep it alive within the confined area of the city hodges truly remarks that the proper course would have been to immediately remove the infected to proper lodgings provided without the walls he continues but what greatly contributed to the loss of people thus shut up was the wicked practice of nurses for they are not to be mentioned but in the most bitter terms these wretches out of greediness to plunder the dead would strangle their patients and charge it to the distemper in their throats others would secretly convey the pestilential taint from sores of the infected to those who were well and so forth if we are to receive the statement seriously and hodges is a temperate writer it throws considerable light on the moral condition of the lower orders the first symptom of the plague appears to have been as a rule a violent shivering or rigour lasting from half an hour to four or five hours this was followed or accompanied by vomiting upon this delirium quickly supervened and if not restrained the infected would run wildly about the streets vertigo headache and coma were also common the signs of fever were strongly marked such as extreme inquietude a most intense heat outwardly attended by unquenchable thirst within dryness blackness of the tongue intolerable heat of the prescordia and all other usual concomitants of a fever's accession in many cases there seem to have been well-marked exacerbations and remissions but this was not constantly observed insomnia was occasionally troublesome and palpitation of the heart appears to have been strongly marked sweating was a common feature and seems often to have been critical the plague subsiding at once by crisis pustules upon the skin varying in size from a pea to a nutmeg and called blains as well as buboes affecting the lymphatic glands were among the ordinary symptoms further in addition to these carbuncles seem to have been very usual and also a petechial eruption and further hodges describes in addition to the foregoing pustules buboes carbuncles and petechiae certain prominent spots with pyramidal heads which were called plague tokens by the vulgar 
the treatment adopted was very far from being of the so-called expectant form which is now so much followed in the management of patients suffering from infective disorders they were put to bed between the blankets and the patient was addressed by his physician with cheerfulness hodges seems to have discouraged phlebotomy but he states that many let blood largely if the patient did not vomit he was given an emetic and this in many cases was followed by an expulsive cathartic in all cases were strong diaphoretics administered and sweating was encouraged to the utmost a marvellous assortment of drugs was poured into the patient those used by hodges were mostly fresh indigenous herbs and he mentions angelica rue sage veronica centauri scabious pimpernel marigold scorzonera ivy berries balm valerian garlic gentian elderberries juniper berries and dozens of others but he speaks scornfully of the oriental bezoar powdered unicorn's horn and powder of toads which many thought very efficacious to all who sweat he says change of clothes is to be denied for the patient takes harm by clean coverings not so much from any prejudicial quality of the soap abounding in them as from a dampness which is inseparable from them and the approach of air which is unavoidable in the shifting both of which will check the sweating sleep was industriously kept off although sometimes through sheer weariness the patient would drop into a doze the diet given was light and generous eggs strong broths and good wines but of the usefulness of gold boiled in the broths hodges has nothing to say the patient was most rigidly kept in his bed and those who were delirious were tied in them during the sweats the patients were forcibly kept awake and if later in the disease a little sleep was allowed they were roused every four hours to take medicine scents were used in the room and odorous gum rosins such as styrax were burnt upon live coals blisters were applied to several parts such as the nape of the neck and the insides of the arms and thighs these blister plasters were made of pitch galbanum wax cantharides yeast euphorbium and vinegar of quills worked into a mass the parts thus blistered were not suffered to heal till the malignity of the disease was spent besides epispastics it is not lost labour to apply proper things to the feet i commonly used a plaster made of the compound betony plaster adding to it some euphorbium saffron and london treacle and i found this to do more good than cataplasms which some however liked better to use and were made of bryony root steeped in vinegar the flesh of pickled herrings black soap rue scordium and arum with a sufficient quantity of vinegar sometimes also pigeons were applied to the feet similar applications were also made to the wrists the buboes were treated with cataplasms and discutients and were often opened by the surgeon and subsequently washed with a lixivivium of ashes scordium betony buglos sanical and so forth in which also was dissolved some london treacle carbuncles were treated in a similar way but when the eschar did not fall off the actual cautery was liberally applied in order to prevent the necessity of using a hot iron it was suggested that sometimes the pestilential venom is to be drawn out by cupping or scarification or epispastics sometimes also for the same purpose is applied the bare rump of a fowl repeated until these creatures appear not to be hurt by it for this natural warmth soothes the vital heat of the part it is applied to and entices away the morbific venom through the pores pigeons used alive and warm sheep's lights have likewise been observed thus to assuage the acrimony of this pestilential virulence hodges is by no means silent on the important subject of prevention and he justly says 
when the nature and peculiar qualities of this disease are known and reported by physicians such laws should be provided as might best conduce to prevent its spreading if not to its utter extirpation the punishment of those who frighten the populace by prophecies and the like the timely separation of the sick from the well house-to-house -house visitation which was actually carried out the disinfection of the air by fumigations the daily cleansing of streets sinks and canals because stench and nastiness are justly reckoned the entertainers of infection the burning of pastilles the killing of dogs cats and other domestic brutes which carry the infection from place to place and great attention to personal health are among the measures which he advocates he has no belief in the benefit to be derived from taking excrement and urine which were given as antidotes by some old nurses but on the other hand he had implicit faith in liberal potations of sack middle-aged neat fine bright racy and of a walnut flavour with regard to the use of tobacco he says i must confess myself at uncertainties about it though as to myself i am its professed enemy and was accustomed to supply its place as an antidote with sack he did not believe in amulets which were then much in vogue some being alleged to have a diffusive magnetic value others drawing the poison out of the body as amber attracts straws some serving to invigorate nature walnut shells filled with mercury arsenic mixed with wax and a variety of other drugs and dried toads seem to have been the amulets most generally worn among the physicians who stayed in london to minister to the sick hodges mentions dr glisson regius professor at cambridge dr nathan paget dr wharton dr berwick dr brooks and many others and he further states that of these eight or nine died hodges however survived and he says i think it not amiss to recite the means which i used to preserve myself from the infection during the continual course of my business among the sick as soon as i rose in the morning early i took the quantity of a nutmeg of the antipestilential electuary then after the dispatch of private concerns in my family i entered into a large room where crowds of citizens used to be in waiting for me and there i commonly spent two or three hours as in an hospital examining the several conditions and circumstances of all who came thither some of which had ulcers yet uncured and others to be advised under the first symptoms of seizure all which i endeavoured to dispatch with all possible care to their various exigencies as soon as this crowd could be discharged i judged it not proper to go abroad fasting and therefore got my breakfast after which till dinner-time i visited the sick at their houses after some hours visiting in this manner i returned home before dinner i always drank a glass of sack to warm the stomach refresh the spirits and dissipate any beginning lodgment of the infection i chose meats for my table that yielded an easy and generous nourishment roasted before boiled and pickles not only suitable to the meats but the nature of the distemper and indeed in this melancholy time the city greatly abounded with variety of all good things of that nature i seldom likewise rose from dinner without drinking more wine after this i had always many persons come for advice and as soon as i could dispatch them i again visited till eight or nine at night and then concluded the evening by drinking to cheerfulness of my old favourite liquor which encouraged sleep and an easy breathing through the pores all night but if in the daytime i found the least approaches of the infection upon me as giddiness loathing at stomach and faintness i immediately had recourse to a glass of this wine which easily drove these beginning disorders away by transpiration yet in the whole course of the infection i found myself ill but twice but was soon again cleared of its approaches by these means and the help of such antidotes as i kept always by me 
it should be mentioned that during the infection dr hodges wore an issue as a preventive measure and he says whenever i was most beset with pestilential fumes i could then immediately perceive a shooting pain in my issue and had a great deal of ill-conditioned matter discharged therefrom and this i always looked upon as a sure warning to have timely recourse to alexipharmix the facts given by dr monk concerning hodges are the following nathaniel hodges son of the vicar of kensington was born in sixteen twenty nine educated at westminster cambridge and oxford and appears to have been a parliamentarian m d sixteen fifty nine f r c p sixteen seventy two censor sixteen eighty two harveyan orator sixteen eighty three during the latter part of his life he received a pension from the city on account of his services during the plague he fell into debt and died at ludgate prison in sixteen eighty eight there is a tablet to his memory in st stephen's walbrook let us not be hard on this brave man he did his duty nobly true he was fond of sack and got into debt perhaps had his nature been less generous and had he been less full of the milk of human kindness he might have amassed a large fortune he is a noble exception to chaucer's doctrine that golden physic is a cordial and it would ill become us to sit in judgment on one who in an important respect affords us an example of noble conduct the year sixteen sixty five and sixteen sixty six were eventful ones for the college of physicians at that time the president was sir edward alston who had managed to repair the financial ruin caused by the civil wars by the expedient of admitting honorary fellows and making them pay for the honour it was in this year that charles the second attended one of the anatomy lectures and knighted the lecturer sir george ent at its termination misfortunes however were in store and we can hardly say they were undeserved when the plague appeared the president and most of the fellows fled from town and during their absence the treasure chest of the college was emptied by thieves after the plague came the great fire and in it the college at amen corner was destroyed when the college was rebuilt a new site not far from the old one was chosen this was in warwick lane newgate street on a piece of ground purchased from mr hollyer a surgeon for one thousand two hundred pounds the new college was designed by wren it was in the form of a quadrangle with a botanical garden behind it running down to the city walls the entrance was through a fine gate and over this sir christopher wren built a magnificent theatre forty feet in diameter with an octagonal domed roof this theatre was said to be a model of what a theatre should be there were in addition fine rooms for transacting the college business and a good library only about a hundred and forty books had been saved from the fire but the new college was soon furnished with books by the library of the marquis of dorchester which that nobleman bequeathed to it he appears to have been a learned and a somewhat eccentric man who studied all manner of learning both divine and human he became a fellow of the college in sixteen fifty eight and shortly before had been made a bencher of gray's inn it is impossible not to regret the fine old college with its spacious courtyard and physic garden and its historic associations but it would seem as if no purely educational establishment can flourish in the city of london the royal society the college of physicians and the college of surgeons have all moved away and gresham college alone is left as if to show the impossibility of flourishing in the richest city of the day much as one may regret the old college it is probable that sir henry halford did right in advising in eighteen twenty four a move to pall mall notwithstanding that the present house is much smaller than the old one and by no means remarkable for the convenience of its arrangement of the london physicians of the seventeenth century none is better known than thomas sydenham 
he was born in sixteen twenty four joined the parliamentary army in sixteen forty three and became m b oxon in sixteen forty eight in what his medical education consisted is not clear it is very doubtful if he was ever at montpellier or any foreign school he was a great friend of john locke he came to london in sixteen sixty and was a licentiate of the college of physicians in sixteen sixty three like the rest of the world he ran away from the plague but as he lived in westminster he did not probably suffer from the fire he died in sixteen eighty nine his medical observations concerning the history and cure of acute diseases was published in sixteen sixty six and was dedicated to robert boyle in the preface of this work he strongly advocates an attempt at a scientific classification of disease by a careful comparison of the phenomena observed in different cases accurate diagnosis was the necessary preliminary to finding a reliable methodus medendi his own descriptions of disease are excellent perhaps his account of the gout from which he suffered is more often quoted than any other he was never a fellow of the college of physicians there is no evidence that he ever applied to be made a fellow expressions are frequent in his writings which seem to show that he was not on the best of terms with some of his contemporaries sydenham was undoubtedly a man who could think for himself and perhaps his chief merit lies in the fact that he appreciated much of the medical writing of his time at its true value it is recorded of him by dr johnson that when sir richard blackmore first engaged in the study of physic he inquired of dr sydenham what authors he should read and was directed by dr sydenham to don quixote which said he is a very good book i read it still in this answer of sydenham's we perhaps get a clue to his attitude towards the profession he was one of the first to use peruvian bark in the treatment of ague and this must have done much to advance his practice at a time when london was scourged by malarious fever one of my objects is to bring before you personal facts with regard to some of our professional ancestors and we get a good idea of sydenham in that chapter of his scheduala monitoria in which he details his own sufferings it was in sixteen sixty that he first suffered from the gout and shortly afterwards symptoms of renal calculus developed and in sixteen seventy six he began to suffer from hematuria this became he says afterwards habitual as often as i either went along a way on foot or drove in a carriage no matter how slowly over the paved streets on an unpaved road however i might drive as far as i chose and no such harm would occur he tried various remedies for this trouble without success i therefore made up my mind to try no further and only guarded against the affection by avoiding as much as i could all motion of the body when his urine became bloody he was bled and he took frequent doses of mana dissolved in whey as a laxative and sixteen drops of laudanum in small beer at bedtime as a hypnotic as to the regimen he observed he says on getting out of bed i drink a dish or two of tea and ride in my coach till noon when i return home and moderately refresh myself for moderation is well in all with some sort of easily digestible meat that i like immediately after dinner i drink rather more than a quarter of a pint of canary wine to promote the concoction of the food in the stomach and to drive away the gout from the bowels after dinner i ride in my coach again and unless prevented by business am driven out for two or three miles in the country for a change of air a draught of thin small beer serves for supper and i repeat this even after i have gone to bed and am about to compose myself to sleep i hope by this julep to cool and dilute the hot and acrid juices lodged in the kidneys whereby the stone is occasioned 
he goes on to state that he prefers the hopped small beer and to prevent bloody urine i take care as often as i drive any distance over the stones to drink a free draught of this small beer upon getting into my coach and also if i am out long before my return a precaution which has always been sufficient occasionally he suffered from what may be called a gastric crisis and in this case i drench myself with more than a gallon of posset or else of this small beer and as soon as i have got rid of the whole by vomiting take a small draught of canary wine with eighteen drops of the liquid laudanum and going to bed compose myself to sleep by this method i have escaped imminent death more than once in an attack of nephritic colic occurring in a patient of sanguine temperament sydenham took ten ounces of blood from the arm on the same side with the kidney affected after this a gallon of posset drink wherein two ounces of marshmallow roots have been boiled must be taken without loss of time followed by the injection of the following enema marshmallow roots and lily roots of each one ounce mallow leaves pellitory bear's breech and chamomile flowers of each a handful linseed and fenugreek of each half an ounce water in sufficient quantity boil down to half a pint strain dissolve in the clear liquor two ounces each of kitchen sugar and syrup of marshmallow mix and make into a clyster after the patient has vomited and been purged a full dose of twenty drops of liquid laudanum is to be given or else fifteen or sixteen grains of matthew's pills sydenham lived in pall mall and cunningham in his handbook of london has the following anecdote which is of interest in connection with his small beer and canary mr fox told mr rogers that sydenham was sitting at his window looking on the mall with his pipe in his mouth and a silver tankard before him when a fellow made a snatch at the tankard and ran off with it nor was he overtaken says fox before he got among the bushes in bond street and there they lost him sydenham lived in pall mall from sixteen sixty four to sixteen eighty nine and was buried in st james church a near neighbour of his was madame eleanor gwynne over whose garden wall king charles the second used often to look as he walked in the mall in st james park sydenham i have said was a licentiate of the college of physicians and was never a fellow in chamberlain's present state of england for sixteen eighty two i find a list of the fellows candidates honorary fellows and licentiates of the college of physicians the name of thomas sydenham does not occur in this list although it contains the name of his son dr william sydenham in sixteen eighty four dr hans sloane a young physician afterwards to be very famous took up his abode with sydenham it was not till after sydenham's death that his reputation reached the exalted position in which it has been held in the lives of many of the early physicians are interesting facts which throw considerable light on the progress of medicine both as a branch of knowledge and a profession but the exigencies of time and space compel me to be brief samuel collins who was president of the college in sixteen ninety five was one of the earliest comparative anatomists and wrote a work entitled a system of anatomy treating of the body of man beasts birds fishes insects and plants i am not acquainted with the work but the title seems to indicate that he had enlarged views on the question of biology nehemiah grew who was secretary to the royal society in sixteen seventy seven and an honorary fellow of the college in sixteen eighty two and possibly earlier is said to have been the first who saw the analogy between animals and plants and to establish the fact of sex in plants in medicine he introduced epsom salts which he obtained by evaporating epsom water so that we owe him a great debt and undoubtedly he is one of the greatest men who has been connected with the college sir edmund king was surgeon to charles the second and was made an honorary f r c p by command of his majesty charles the second being seized with apoplexy on february second sixteen eighty four king promptly bled his majesty without consultation 
his act was subsequently approved by his colleagues and he was ordered a thousand pounds by the privy council which was never paid francis bernard was apothecary to st bartholomew's hospital and when the staff of that institution ran away from the plague bernard stopped at his post and ministered to the wants of the patients for this he was rewarded by being made assistant physician to the hospital and became honorary f r c p in sixteen eighty he died in sixteen ninety seven and is buried in st botolph's aldersgate End of number six. Number seven of London, Ancient and Modern. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two, London from the Medical Point of View, Part four. Secret Remedies, The Crusade Against Quackery, Medicine in the Days of Pepys, The Barber Surgeons, The First Anatomy Lectures, The Apothecaries secret remedies two centuries ago and even later than this it was not thought unprofessional for a physician to have secret remedies thus dr goddard who was much trusted by oliver cromwell who was one of the original members of the royal society professor at gresham college the friend of sydenham and a fellow of the college in sixteen forty six was the inventor of goddard's drops the most notable instance of professional secrets however is that of the midwifery forceps this was the secret of the chamberlain family of whom i will mention two peter chamberlain m d padua f r c p sixteen twenty eight was probably the first fashionable obstetrician and is supposed to have been the inventor of the forceps he made an attempt to organize the monthly nurses was much employed about the english court and had eighteen children by his two wives hugh chamberlain the son of hugh chamberlain and the nephew of peter chamberlain f r c p sixteen ninety four was the most celebrated man midwife of his day he published a translation of Morisot's midwifery and in the preface to that book he says i will now take leave to offer an apology for not publishing the secret i mention we have to extract children without hooks where other artists use them viz there being my father and two brothers living that practise this art i cannot esteem it my own to dispose of nor publish it without injury to them and i think i have not been unserviceable to my own country although i do but inform them that the forementioned three persons of our family and myself can serve them in these extremities with greater safety than others this is a very pretty specimen of medical ethics on the part of one who was a censor of the college as late as seventeen twenty one what are probably the original forceps were accidentally discovered in eighteen fifteen at woodham mortimer hall essex formerly the residence of peter chamberlain they were found under a trap-door in the floor of the uppermost of a series of closets built over the entrance porch and may now be seen in the library of the royal medico chirurgical society hugh chamberlain is buried in westminster abbey where a latin epitaph of seventy-two lines by bishop atterbury adorns his tomb i feel tempted to mention two or three more of the early physicians who are deservedly famous but in doing so i must limit myself to those who flourished mainly in the seventeenth century john radcliffe who became f r c p in sixteen eighty seven appears to have been a blustering kindly and successful practitioner he spoke his mind freely even to monarchs and seems to have made his way more by push than courtesy his chief claim to be remembered is as a public benefactor he accumulated a large fortune and founded at oxford the radcliffe library radcliffe infirmary radcliffe observatory and radcliffe travelling fellowship and also left five hundred pounds a year to st bartholomew's hospital london for improving the diets of the patients radcliffe was only one of many london doctors who have been great public benefactors 
i have already alluded to lineker keyes harvey baldwin hamy caldwell and croon and the list may be enlarged by mentioning sir hans sloane who founded the british museum and gave the chelsea garden to the apothecary society william and john hunter erasmus wilson and richard quain the last and the most munificent benefactor of this university college sir hans sloane was born in sixteen sixty became f r c p in sixteen eighty seven was president from seventeen nineteen to seventeen thirty five and died in seventeen fifty three in his ninety fourth year he was president of the royal society from seventeen twenty seven succeeding sir isaac newton and retired to chelsea in seventeen forty where his name still lives in sloane street and hans place in his youth he accompanied the duke of albemarle to jamaica and returned home with a valuable botanical collection he was a great accumulator of archaeological and natural curiosities and his collection was by his will offered to the nation at a nominal sum and thus was founded the british museum sir hans sloane was born in the last days of the commonwealth only three years after the death of harvey in evelyn's diary we read how on april sixteenth sixteen ninety one he evelyn went to see dr sloane's curiosities being an universal collection of the natural productions of jamaica and so forth he lived in the reign of charles the second james the second anne william the third george the first and george the second and died five years after the birth of jeremy bentham who was so active in the foundation of university college the crusade against quackery perhaps the main object held in view by those who were instrumental in establishing the medical corporations was protection and certain it is that the monopoly of medical licensing enjoyed by the physicians and barber surgeons in london and seven miles round was very great no small amount of the energies of the college of physicians was in its earlier days devoted to the fighting of irregular practitioners but this was and is a hopeless battle we have seen how henry the eighth protected the rights of physicians and surgeons but then as now there was a great deal of public sympathy for irregular practitioners and accordingly we find that in the thirty-fourth and thirty-fifth year of the reign of henry the eighth an act was passed the chief clauses of which were to the following effect that the surgeons mindful only of their own lucres and nothing the profit or ease of the diseased or patient have sued troubled and vexed divers honest persons as well men as women whom god hath endued with the knowledge of the nature kind and operation of certain herbs roots and waters and the using and ministering of them to such as be pained with customable diseases as women's breast being sore a pen and a web in the eye uncomes of hands scaldings burnings sore mouths the stone strangury sosilin and morphew and much other like diseases and so forth and so forth therefore it shall be lawful for any person to cure outward sores notwithstanding the statute of the third of henry the eighth the public did not like being deprived of their favourite quacks and wise women and the same feeling undoubtedly obtains at present in this country where hundreds of newspapers are kept afloat almost entirely by quack advertisements and the proprietor of a pill and ointment has recently died possessed of wealth probably greater than that of all the fellows of both the royal colleges collectively these are significant facts and ought to warn us not to waste our energies in attempting to oppose human nature dr goodall in his account of the college of physicians published in sixteen eighty four gives many curious details of the conflicts of the college with quacks and empirics the college possessed magisterial power and on conviction the president and censors had power to fine and imprison for instance in sixteen thirty two francis rose alias ventner was accused of undertaking to cure a woman of a timpany for which he had made exorbitant charges being asked what medicines he gave at first he refused to discover them saying he had them noted in his books 
but after long expostulation he named jalap and elatorium as he pronounced the word and being questioned what elatorium was made of he said it was composed of three or four things whereof diagridium was one he was censured for giving elatorium a medicine he knew not and particularly to a woman at his own house whom he afterwards sent home through the open streets telling her it was a cordial he was fined ten pounds and committed to prison again we find one richard hammond a surgeon fined five pounds and committed to prison for undertaking to cure a child of the dropsy it appears that he administered a cluster composed of molasses white hellebore and red mercury which wrought so violently that the boy died therewith john hope an apothecary's apprentice gets into trouble for giving a man two apples of coloquintidae boiled in white wine with cinnamon and nutmeg the medicine wrought both upwards and downwards upward he vomited a fatty matter and downward he voided a pottle of blood and ultimately died this case was remitted to the higher courts of justice in sixteen thirty seven an order was sent from the star chamber to examine the pretended cures of one leveret who said that he was a seventh son and undertook the cure of several diseases by stroking the investigation of this case lasted over a month and finally the college reported that leveret was an impostor in the fourth year of king edward the sixth one grig a poulterer of surrey taken among the people for a prophet in curing diverse diseases by words and prayers and saying he would take no money and so forth was by command of the earl of warwick and others and the council set on a scaffold in the town of croydon in surrey with a paper on his breast whereon was written his deceitful and hypocritical dealings and after that on the eighth of september set on a pillory in southwark being then our lady fair then kept and the mayor of london with his brethren the aldermen riding through the fair the said grig asked them and all the citizens forgiveness of the like counterfeit physician saith stowe have i noted to be set on horseback his face to the horse-tail the same tail in his hand for a bridle a collar of jordans about his neck a whetstone on his breast and so led through the city of london with ringing of basins and banished the above are examples of dozens of similar cases and it is interesting to note that many of these irregular practitioners had powerful friends and we find ministers of state writing on behalf of some of them praying that the punishment may be remitted medicine in the days of pepys in order to complete the picture of the profession in the seventeenth century i have abstracted from the diary of truthful samuel pepys a few facts having a bearing on medicine these seem to me to throw no little light upon the science practice and ethics of medicine at his time march twenty sixth sixteen sixty this day it is two years since it pleased god that i was cut for the stone at mrs turner's in salisbury court and did resolve while i live to keep it a festival as i did the last year at my house and for ever to have mrs turner and her company with me but now it pleased god that i am prevented to do it openly only within my soul i can and do rejoice and bless god being at this time blessed be his holy name in as good health as ever i was in my life october nineteenth sixteen sixty three coming to st james i hear that the queen did sleep five hours of pretty well to-night and that she waked and gargled her mouth and to sleep again but that her pulse beats fast beating twenty to the king's or my lady suffolk's eleven it seems she was so ill as to be shaved and pigeons put to her feet and to have the extreme unction given her by the priests who were so long about it that the doctors were angry the king they say is most fondly disconsolate for her and weeps by her which makes her weep which one this day told me he reckons a good sign for that it carries away some room from the head october twentieth 
mrs sarah blank tells us that the queen's sickness is the spotted fever and that she is as full of spots as a leopard twenty second this morning hearing that the queen grows worse again i sent to stop the making of my velvet cloak till i see whether she lives or dies twenty fourth the queen is in a good way to recovery and sir francis pridgen Prugine, president of the royal college of physicians hath got great honour by it it being all imputed to his cordial january sixteenth sixteen sixty seven prince rupert i hear is very ill yesterday given over but better to-day twenty eighth prince rupert is very bad still and so bad that he do now yield to be trepanned february third to whitehall talking and among other things of the prince's being trepanned which was in doing just as we passed through the stone gallery we asking at the door of his lodgings and were told so we are full of wishes for the good success though i dare say but few do really concern ourselves for him in our hearts with others into the house and there hear that the work is done to the prince in a few minutes without any pain at all to him he not knowing when it was done it was performed by moulins having cut the outward table as they call it they find the inner all corrupted so as to come out without any force and the fear is that the whole inside of his head is corrupted like that which do yet make him afraid of him but no ill accident appeared in all the doing of the thing but with all imaginable success as sir alexander fraser did tell me himself i asked him who is very kind to me april third this day i saw prince rupert abroad in the vain room pretty well as he used to be and looks as well only something appears to be under his periwig on the crown of his head fourth at the duke of arbemile's one at the table told an odd passage in the late plague that at petersfield i think he said one side of the street had every house almost infected through the town and the other not one shut up june twenty eighth sixteen sixty seven home and there find my wife making of tea a drink which mr pelling the potticary tells her is good for her cold and defluxions november twenty first with creed to a tavern where dean wilkins and others and a good discourse among the rest of a man that is a little frantic and that is poor and a debauched man that the college have hired for twenty shillings to have some of the blood of a sheep let into his body and it is to be done on saturday next they purpose to let in about twelve ounces which they compute is what will be let in in a minute's time by a watch on that occasion dr whistler president of the royal college of physicians told a pretty story related by muffet a good author of dr keyes that built keyes college that being very old and living only at that time upon woman's milk he while he fed upon the milk of an angry fretful woman was so himself and then being advised to take it of a good-natured patient woman he did become so beyond the common temper of his age thirtieth i was pleased to see the person who had his blood taken out saying he finds himself much better since and as a new man but he is cracked a little in his head though he speaks very reasonably and very well he had but twenty shillings for his suffering it and is to have the same again tried upon him the first sound man that ever had it tried on him in england and but one that we hear of in france june twenty third sixteen sixty eight to mr turberville about my eyes whom i met with and he did discourse i thought learnedly about them and takes time before he did prescribe me anything to think of it twenty ninth to dr turberville's and there did receive a direction for some physic and also a glass of something to drop into my eyes he gives me hope that i may do well july third to an alehouse met mr pierce the surgeon and dr clark waldron turberville my physician for the eyes and lower to dissect several eyes of sheep and oxen with great pleasure and to my great information 
but strange that this turberville should be so great a man and yet to this day has seen no eyes dissected or but once but desired this dr lower to give him the opportunity to see him dissect some thirteenth this morning i was let blood and did bleed about fourteen ounces towards curing my eye thirty first the month ends sadly with me my eyes being now past all use almost and i am mighty hot about trying the late printed experiment of paper tubes august eleventh mighty pleased with a trial i have made of the use of a tube spectacle of paper tried with my right eye cesar morelli a music master wrote thus to mr pepys on april eleventh sixteen eighty one honoured sir i did receive your last letter dated the ninth of this month with much grief having an account of your painful fever i pray god it will not vex your body too much and if by chance it should vex you longer there is here a man that can cure it with sympathetical powder if you please to send me down the parings of the nails of both your hands and your foots and three locks of hair of the top of your crown i hope with the grace of god it will cure you and so forth the barber surgeons much as we owe to the college of physicians we owe even more to the early surgeons and there is certainly no spot in this city which has a greater interest for us as students of medicine than the hall of the barber's company in monkwell street a street not far from the general post office the house in knight rider street the original home of the college of physicians is gone the house in amen corner the second home of the college was burnt the grand college in warwick lane was deserted and sold and has now completely disappeared the barber's hall remains and commands our respect as being on the original spot though not the original building where the study of anatomy took its rise in this country the barbers and surgeons have occupied premises in monkwell street certainly since their first incorporation in fourteen sixty possibly earlier the present hall was built by inigo jones and having partially escaped the fire in sixteen sixty six much of the original building remains and certainly the present court-room and the elaborately carved shell canopy over the front door are both works which do credit to this famous architect originally the hall stood detached from other buildings and seems to have had a fair-sized piece of ground round it and a garden at the back and its theatre one of inigo jones best works rested on one of the bastions of the old city wall with land at its present enormous value it is not to be wondered at though much to be regretted that the company has turned every available inch to account and the medical antiquary who now goes in search of this to us almost sacred edifice will need to be warned that it is hemmed in and hidden by warehouses it was in fifteen forty that henry the eighth gave a charter to the barber surgeons and holbein's famous picture of this event is the chief treasure of the barber's hall which contains many other relics of medical interest in this picture which has been often engraved and is doubtless familiar to many of you there are certain points which merit our attention it is a group of nineteen people and it is probable that the portraits of all are faithful the portrait of henry the eighth was said by king james the first to be reported very like him and well done and it is probable that the portraits of the others are equally good the king is seated and the eighteen persons receiving the charter are on their knees these eighteen are arranged in two groups a group of three on the right hand of the king and a group of fifteen on the left those on the right are probably entitled to take precedence of the others they are all members of the king's household viz john chambra the king's physician who was as we have seen one of the six persons named in the charter of the college of physicians sir william butts physician to henry the eighth and one of the characters in shakespeare's play of that name and master j alsop the royal apothecary 
the fifteen on the left are all surgeons or barbers the chief to whom the king is handing the charter is thomas vickery the king's sergeant surgeon and the first medical officer appointed to st bartholomew's hospital of the others aliff mumford and ferris were king's surgeons and simpson harmon and penn were king's barbers of the remaining eight little is known the first anatomy lectures the original charter of the barber surgeons provided that the two mysteries of barbary and surgery should be kept distinct and it gave facilities for obtaining the bodies of executed felons for purposes of anatomical study there is no doubt that the anatomy lectures at the barber surgeons hall preceded those given by the physicians the necessity of a knowledge of anatomy must have been felt daily by these early surgeons and like practical men they took steps to supply their wants the giving of these lectures a physician being appointed lecturer was the chief work of the company some of the particulars collected by mr south are of interest as showing how this first london school of anatomy was worked every member of the company was bound to attend the anatomy demonstrations a fine of fourpence being imposed upon those freemen who were late and sixpence upon those who were absent for each summons to an anatomy the sum of three shillings four pence was charged whether present or absent and the members of the company were bound to come decently apparelled for their own honesty and also for the worship of the company the anatomical demonstrations appear to have been public and their occurrence was a solemn festival in fact in the early days of the company private anatomies were disallowed except by special license from the court there were two masters of anatomy appointed yearly and two stewards of anatomy to look after the creature comforts of those who attended the demonstration it was also the duty of the masters and stewards to fetch the body from the place of execution which was not always an enviable duty the actual lecture and demonstration was given by a fifth officer a reader specially chosen who was generally a physician the masters of anatomy had to make due provision for the comfort of the doctor and they were specially charged to provide a mat about the hearth in the hall in order that he might not suffer from cold feet they also had to provide two fine white rods for demonstrating a wax candle to look into the body necessary instruments and clean white sleeves and aprons for each day for themselves as well as for the reader a fine of forty shillings was imposed for inattention to these necessary details the greatest formality was observed the notices of the forthcoming demonstration were issued according to a regulated formula which differed according to the rank in the company of the person bidden and after assembling in the parlour a procession to the theatre was marshalled by the clerk in due form there were two demonstrations daily at noon and at five and between the morning and afternoon lecture the court and officials were plentifully regaled the doctor or reader pulling off his own robes and putting on the clerk's which has always been usual for him to dine in these demonstrations went on for three consecutive days and at their close the clerk attends the doctor in the clothing-room where he presents him folded up in a piece of paper the sum of ten pounds and where afterwards he waits on the masters of anatomy and presents each of them in the like manner with the sum of three pounds after each public demonstration the lecturer was allowed to give a private demonstration to his own pupils for three days after which the body was decently interred and the expenses incurred by the masters of anatomy three pounds seven shillings sixpence were reimbursed seats were provided in the theatre and the body was surrounded by a curtain until the demonstration actually began among the curiosities in barber's hall is a portrait of sir charles scarborough the physician to charles the second in the act of giving an anatomical lecture with a subject before him and alderman arras at his side assisting him 
scarborough who was a good anatomist and distinguished mathematician is represented as seated dressed in full robes of scarlet and ermine wearing a velvet hat with jewelled band and with lace cuffs and alderman arras is scarcely less gorgeous alderman arras together with dr gale endowed those lectures which are still given at the college of surgeons and which are known as the arras and gale lectures this dr gale is not to be confounded with thomas gale sergeant surgeon to queen elizabeth one of the earliest english writers on surgery it was on february twenty seventh sixteen sixty two that samuel pepys records that about eleven o'clock commissioner pett and i walked to chirurgeon's hall we being all invited thither and promised to dine there where we were led into the theatre and by and by comes the reader dr tern with the master and company in a very handsome manner and all being settled he began his lecture and his discourse being ended we had a fine dinner and good learned company many doctors of physic and we used with extraordinary great respect among other observables we drunk the king's health out of a gilt cup given by king henry the eighth to this company with bells hanging on it which every man is to ring by shaking after he hath drunk up the whole cup dr scarborough took some of his friends and i went with them to see the body of a lusty fellow a seaman that was hanged for robbery the cup to which pepys alludes and other interesting pieces of plate are still in the possession of the company and they also have an excellent picture of inigo jones by van dyke and many other pictures of interest there are also to be seen four silver wreaths worn by the master and wardens on state occasions and upstairs is a massive oak table said to be the original table used for anatomical purposes the apprentices of the company were kept in order for example they were not allowed to wear a beard of more than fifteen days growth and in case of offence in this particular the master was fined six shillings eight pence apprentices were bound to be able to read and write and those that intended practising in london passed what appear to have been preliminary examinations how he knoweth what the surgery and also what an anatomy is and how many parts it is of what the three elements and the eleven signs be which is the first part of examination for apprentice the apprentice was then bound to read to the court every half year an epistle in order that the court might judge of his progress and he first became a probationer and was licensed for so many years at the end of which time subject to good behaviour and adequate knowledge he was admitted a master of surgery and anatomy the fee for the apprentice's examination appears to have been a silver spoon with his name upon it weighing one ounce and sevenpence to the clerk for writing and sealing the examination fee for the great diploma appears to have been six pounds six shillings the apothecaries we have seen that the physicians were an offshoot from the priests and the surgeons an offshoot from the barbers in the same way the apothecaries were originally linked with the grocers and it was not till sixteen seventeen that james i gave to the apothecaries company an independent charter the apothecaries were originally druggists pure and simple but they took to prescribing and this brought them into conflict with the physicians in the end the apothecaries were victorious and finally in eighteen fifteen they acquired the rights of examining and licensing which are practically the same as they now possess end of number seven